and welcome to the latest Beta Shares webinar. My name is Sarah Hare. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest quarterly economic and investment update. Some important information to start with. This information and what we talk about is general in nature. Investment in BetaShares funds are subject to investment risk and investors should do their research, read the PDS, and before making any financial decision, consult a professional. Before we start, uh, we would love to answer your questions and if you have any feedback, please feel free to use the widget on the right hand side um, or, or on the screen and ask a question throughout the session. We will be sa saving some time at the end of today to answer those questions um, and David will be, um, will be keen to answer them. A recording of the session and the slides will be sent to all regist registrants uh, at the end of today. Before we start, just a little reminder about the regular content and information that can be found on our website. We have a regular weekly insights email. We also have a short Monday morning update from David Bassanese, Bassanese Bites, um, and, and that's just a, a quick heads up on what's happening in the market and things to, things to look for. Um, and please follow us on our socials for the latest news and information. A little bit about BetaShares, um, Australian, uh, Australian grown ETF provider. We have the broadest range of funds on the ASX, we're now up to 63, um, and over 17 billion in funds under management, but always with the focus uh, and, and objective of providing smart, intelligent investment solutions for Australian investors. So, getting on to today, um, I'm delighted to welcome my colleague David Bassanese, BetaShares Chief Economist. Hopefully, most of you will be familiar with David. Um, absolutely um, a, a key, key figure in the BetaShares business. David wrote for the AFR um, and is the author of Australia's ETF, uh, ETF in Australian Guide to ETF. So, before, um, Without further delay, I'm delighted to hand over to David, who will be taking us through the webinar today, uh, Will Inflation Spoil the Equities Party? So David, over to you. Thanks very much, Sarah, and uh, good to be with you all today for the um, um, latest quarterly economic update, and obviously coming hot on the heels of, uh, if you follow uh, financial markets, you know, quite big developments overnight with a with a much bigger inflation outcome uh, in the US in April and the equity markets, um, you know, reeling back a, as a result. So I'll definitely touch on that. Um, so it has been a big theme of uh, my presentation today. Obviously that number even bigger than I expected, but, um, and I'll sort of touch on, you know, what I think all that means um, going forward. Um, but, but let me just you know, stick with the current structure of it and, and start off with the, the COVID situation. Um, actually, if you just want to go back one slide to the agenda items, um, whoever's running it. Thank you, yeah, so the agenda items, we're gonna just touch on COVID firstly, uh, the situation there. Um, then the economic outlook, you know, how the economy, both in Australia and, and globally, particularly the US, is, is, is traveling at the moment. Um, then you know what that means for the markets, for what are the challenges and opportunities in the in the financial markets, uh, and then touch on some investment themes um, uh, uh, arising uh, out of, out of all of that. So firstly, with regard to COVID, uh, on the next slide there, this is a, a chart of um, both cases um, and and um, the, uh, the, the 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 cases both. Um, um, and the and the, and the death rates in, in in countries and you can see the we've had had the multiple waves uh, the US is, has has um, gone through its third wave and uh, as of as of recent weeks uh, the rate of cases has certainly come down and not flared back up again uh, also the case in Europe and uh, the United Kingdom so 
I think, you know, we've seen the worst uh, knock on wood in terms of the COVID cases in these major parts of the global economy. And as I'll touch on in a minute, the vaccine rollouts are progressing and that certainly, you know, reduces the risk of any major flare up, uh, particularly again, particularly in terms of the United States, in terms of global financial market outlook, what happens in the US remains vitally uh, important. And as you can see in the Australia, you know, continuing to do very well there on the on the coat with the COVID situation, uh, with, with cases and death rates, you know, very very low by the standards of other um, um, Western economies. Just in terms of the vaccines now, so I mean, this has been the big development. Um, just on the next slide, um, and again, the, you know, what's been quite impressive in recent months has been how quickly the US and to some extent the UK have managed to be able to roll out um, their, their vaccines. So in the US. Um, you're looking at, you know, 70% of people having had at least one, one jab. Uh, and again, I think we're seeing a speedy rollout in, in, in areas such as the US and, and the UK because of uh, the urgency of doing it. They still, you know, were it not for the vaccines, these countries would still be, you know, really struggling with COVID. Um, and and where, as is the case in Europe, whereas at least the rollout um, in the Europe um, it's not as smooth. They're still having a lot of administrative problems in rolling it out. But the good news, at least, is that the US um, uh, and the UK, the, the rollout is progressing uh, pretty well, which, which should help dampen COVID. But in Australia, again, the urgency is not as great, so we haven't felt the compulsion to sort of really get on 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 board with with the vaccine rollout. But you know that is slowly happening. I mean, there's some debates as to whether we've got the right vaccine, the AstraZeneca one. There's some question marks about, um, you know, the blood clotting. I mean, it is a a very rare case, very very rare case of getting uh, any blood clots with the with the AstraZeneca. But nonetheless, um, that that may be having uh, making people somewhat cautious. Um, but the, but in terms of globally, that that's the important point that um, the vaccines are rolling out. Uh, we're we're somewhat behind the game, but that should pick up. Um, and the urgency, at least in Australia, because we've dealt with COVID so well. Uh, ha has not been as great. In terms of the economic outlook now, so what is, how is the economy traveling? So first and foremost, again, focus on the US economy. This is a chart of the PMI indices for manufacturing and services. And as you can see, you know, we, we are witnessing a V-shaped recovery uh, in the global economy driven by the US. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as you saw with the budget in, in Australia this week, um, uh, in Australia, the the economy has uh, far far surpassed the even the best case expectations uh, this time last year. So, um, as evident there for um, various uh, indices for both manufacturing and services in the U.S. economy. If you look at the next slide there of the Biden the income now the Biden uh, you know President Biden he did promise a a two trillion dollar stimulus package in the election campaign. He delivered that. Uh, a couple of months ago, even though the economy was roaring back pretty well. So as I've argued, that stimulus ended up being completely unnecessary, um, but he's he's gone ahead with it nonetheless. And what you've seen in this slide is that the um, you've had a big spike in, in income, that blue line. Um, consumption has gone up, but not as much. And so the savings rate, the household savings rate um, has gone up. So households in the US, as in Australia, have got a lot of... Um, uh, cash still in the bank. And the big debate going forward this year will be what do they do with that? Will they bank that? Will they basically treat that as, as new wealth um, to pay down debt? Um, or will they see it as a windfall gain that they can go out and, 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 and spend? And that is one of the, uh, was going to dictate the, the ongoing speed of the recovery um, this year. I suspect that they will go out and spend a lot of it. So I think there's probably a lot more um, upside uh, in the US economy uh, to come, and we saw overnight. And I'll, you know, just to go into the next slide here, um, the inflation story uh, I've got here. The inflation numbers uh, should pick up. And I said one of the reasons everyone was anticipating a pickup in inflation in the US was because this time last year we had some negative prints on um, on inflation, so price declines over March and April due to the COVID collapse. And so even if prices on a monthly basis were pretty benign, you were gonna get an increase in the so-called annual rate, the year-on-year -year comparison was gonna jump up. Now, what happened overnight is the CPI, the core CPI in the US, excluding food and energy, energy was expected to go up by 0.3%. Um, and that was gonna push the annual rate uh, from 1.6 to 2.3. That number came out at 0.9%. So three times what people expected, it was quite a shock. 
Okay, so just in terms of inflation, again, if you go through the details, you can sort of see why inflation in the US did spike up in April. Um, you get a hotel prices going up. You had new car prices surging on the back of the Biden stimulus. A lot of um, um, you know people going out buying pickup truck, used pickup trucks, presumably. Now the question going for, and but I guess the other element is you did see things like restaurant prices going up, uh, taking away um, you know meals uh, from restaurants. And again, the anecdotes are that wages in that area have had to go up for uh, businesses to find staff. Um, so that is one example of, you know, supply, uh, you know, constraints, labour tightness, um, causing some pricing pressure, but obviously in a very limited part. Now, and um, I guess to the extent there are, it is due to um, lingering COVID restrictions. I mean, that should resolve itself uh, in the next few months. There is a debate about, and, you know, that maybe they do need to ultimately raise their wages to some degree to entice people back if, if they have... Um, uh, increased minimum wages, but uh, but they haven't done that. What they have done is increase the unemployment benefit temporarily up until September. Um, and again, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the case, but there, you know, some suggestions are that, um, that one of the reasons of finding it hard to find hospitality staff is that um, the uh, increase to the unemployment benefits in, in the short run. But even if if that were the case, uh, that those extra unemployment benefits do run off um, in September. Um, and maybe you do just get a one-off wage adjustment nonetheless to, um, to, to allow for that fact. Um, but the big debate going forward is that will inflation basically now start to assist, you know, sustainably take off? And I still don't think that will be the case. Um, also, I don't think the Fed is necessarily going to uh, change its tune. I mean, what really matters for markets is does this, well, inflation in and of itself does obviously matter for markets, but um, But, but what does ultimately matter is um, is uh, if, if that's even if inflation does remain contained, what, what also matters is what the Fed does with interest rates or what it signals with interest rates. And the US um, at the moment is saying that the increase in inflation is going to be fairly um, temporary, this increase in inflation, because ultimately unemployment is still well above full employment. And also, let's not forget, the Fed is actually targeting inflation. It not only wants to see inflation at 2%, but actually above 2% for um, uh, for a little while to make up for the fact that it's been below 2% for so long. Um, so I, bottom line here is I think uh, we still need to wait a few months before we can be confident that the, um, the, uh, the, the increase in inflation we've seen in the US is something more than just a temporary effect. Um, and until you know there's evidence of that, I don't think the Federal Reserve is going to change its um, policy guidance and, and signal higher rates, which I think ultimately should contain the rise uh, in, in bond yields. And then, then I do think, you know, ultimately it will be proven that the inflation uptick has been fairly temporary. Uh, just going to the next slide. Uh, so just in terms of the Australian economy, I mean, again, you know, confidence has been booming back. Their business confidence, um, consumer confidence. Um, I might just race through a couple of these slides because I think this is, um, you know, you just need to read the papers and see, see what the government had to say about the budget to know the economy is doing quite well at the moment. If we just go to the next slide there. Uh, unemployment rate, again, has significantly exceeded expectations. So hiring intentions, you look at the NAB Employment Index uh, and ANZ job ads. Now, those, are in, those dashed lines are inverted. So the fact that those lines are falling means that uh, hiring intentions and job ads are rising, uh, which would be consistent with further declines in the unemployment rate. So both the RBA and the Fed, uh, sorry, the RBA and the government have the unemployment rate falling uh, to sub five percent uh, over the next uh, next uh, year um, uh, and approaching uh, full employment. So that's pretty good. Housing sector rebounding. I mean, the job, the uh, home home grant. You know, for um, if you're building a new home, you were getting up to twenty five thousand. To the end of last year, and up until end of March, a fifteen thousand dollar grant to go over the cost of um, of, of um, uh, building a new home. And what we've seen, funnily enough, I don't know, well, funny or not, but if you look at the RBA. They say most of that increase has been offset by higher uh, new uh, 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 prices. So um, the, the net effect on the CPI in terms of new the cost of new housing uh, has been offset. So um, yes, it's been good, but I mean, it hasn't really lowered the cost of housing all that much. It's just uh, meant that um, you know, the, um, the price of uh, the new houses has gone up to reflect the, uh, the, the grant. 
But nonetheless, um, it has encouraged a lot of people to get into the market. So we've seen home building approvals rising quite strongly, uh, both for new homes and also, also for established homes. And, uh, you know, affordability because of low interest rates. Uh, um, the V-shaped economy, uh, the rebound in employment, all contributing to a, a strong uptick in, uh, in housing demand. Um, at this stage, mainly by owner-occupiers, but I think investors are slowly also starting to come back into the market. Just on the next slide there, um, as we're seeing house prices are rebounding. I mean, I've been uh, pretty bullish on house prices now for probably the past six or so months, and I see no reason why there's going to be much of a let up on the house price front um, for a while yet. And that's, uh, again, the RBA is actually sort of encouraging that at the moment. They see it as part of the the, uh, the improved balance sheets of households, if you like, and, and it's going to encourage households to uh, to keep spending uh, and to keep the economy uh, moving up. And, and in turn helping push the, the unemployment rate down, which is the absolute focus now for both the RBA uh, and the government. So on the next slide, uh, and I said, so the RBA, a bit like the Fed, still at this stage promising not to raise interest rates until at least 2024, even with their upgraded economic outlook. And um, and again, so the RBA basically want to see wage inflation picking up to say three to 4%. And even with unemployment, you know, eventually falling to say as low as 4.75 percent, they don't they don't see it happening until for a couple of years. And even then, only then will you start to see wage inflation picking up. So that's why, even though you've had a big upgrade to the outlook, uh, the RBA at this stage at least hasn't changed their tune on interest rates. And uh, I don't expect they will certainly for the next three to six months at least, you know, change their tune. They may there may may come a time where they where they do change if the Fed, for example changes its uh, signalling on interest rates if the increase in inflation in the US does prove to be a bit more sustained than we think, uh, but it won't sort of move ahead of the Fed. Just on uh, going to the market outlook then. So these have been my, my views actually. I, that I, I actually see core inflation in the US, so CPI X uh, uh, food and energy dropping back below 2% by year end. Now that's I got to say that so with that number last night, that's looking a bit more of a challenge. Um, uh, the question now will be what the monthly numbers do, because the annual rate may well stay above two percent um, if we don't get a big, you know, payback in terms of price declines over the next couple of months. But um, I, I guess I, I still suspect that the monthly run of numbers beyond the next couple of months will start to um, peter off again uh, and still uh, have a fairly benign. Um, the US inflation story as um, you know, supply bottlenecks get unplugged. That in turn means that 10-year bond yield should stay uh, pretty low, and I've got a target there of still sub 2%. Uh, they've they obviously increased uh, of late. Um, and if you just go back to the previous slide, uh, and then and then uh, if, if that all comes to pass, if inflate interest rates do stay pretty low, then the, the, the price to earnings ratio of the market valuations um, can stay up close to sort of current levels. So two, two and two. So the, the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio can keep a, uh, keep a, a two handle on it. It's around about 21, 22 times earnings now. And so maybe we can still end the, end the year with that, the, the P ratio with it, say around 20 to 21, uh, subject to interest rates not increasing. That's Hence my two, two and two outlook at the moment. But uh, I do point out that that inflation number last night is going to start to challenge the first of those. Go to the next slide then. Um, and this is the issue with interest rates. Really, uh, the, the, I guess just to simplify this slide, I, I model bond yields based on the Fed funds rate and the market's expectation of that Fed funds rate over the following 12 months. If you think the market will end the year still comfortable in the view that the Fed won't be raising rates in 2022, then my estimate suggests 10-year bond yield should still stay below 2%. And, and the example there is what we saw in 2012, uh, 2013 for a time, and I've got that highlighted there in the, the, um, the grey circle, um, where, where, where the market had the you know, no policy tightening expectation, 10-year bond yields did average sub 2% over that period. So that's a sort of environment that I still see persisting uh, uh, by year end. Go to the next slide. That in turn means that that PE ratio, which is up around about 20 odd times earnings, um, well, this is the global MSCI, actually, you see it's near, near 20 times earnings, can probably hold up around those levels. Um, because if you look at the yield relative to where interest rates are, i.e., the equity to bond yield gap, 
that's still not too bad. It's sort of broadly in line with its uh, with its uh, long run average. Just moving uh, quite a, uh, moving along. The earnings story is also quite good. Um, so the forward earning, if you go through the numbers there, the way that 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 orange line is going to keep rising and touch that blue line at the end of the year, which is uh, expected markets earnings for 2022. Um, so forward earnings, the way they calculated, equal what the market expects earnings to be for the following calendar year uh, at the end of the year. Um, and so if expectations hold up, you're looking at um, a high single digits and possibly even you know um, more than that in terms of earnings growth in the US market over the rest of this year. So those are still holding up. I mean, I show this slide regularly and uh, important as you see, earnings expectations still holding up and if anything, have been revised up somewhat in the last few months. In Australia, also positive, but the earnings growth not as great um, as we're seeing in global markets, which is one of the reasons I tend to um, see better opportunities um, on a you know market for market comparison, Australia versus global markets. Moving right along, uh, what could go wrong? I said, I, look, first and foremost is that interest rate inflation story. So that, that increase in inflation in the US, we don't want to see more of that over the next few months. If we do, um, then, you know, um, batten down the hatches because uh, bond yields will break up above 2%, maybe even 3%, and we'll see, you know, a pretty decent correction in equity prices of 15 possibly even 20%. Um, but if that were not to happen, I think the, the correction in the market should be uh, fairly well contained. Again, my base case view is that we won't see the start of a, a serious uptrend in inflation. Rising tensions in China. These are things I've mentioned in the past, so I won't, won't dwell on them. Um, I, I ultimately don't think China... China's do, doing what it's doing for domestic political purposes, and it won't necessarily escalate things to an extent that um, it threatens its own economy. Um, and, it, and we've got to also watch quite interesting this uh, talk about inflation now it may well kill the you, you know, the Biden infrastructure package I think the, I think there's more and more talk about this fiscal stimulus maybe it has been too much in the US uh, he is still proposing a big infrastructure package albeit something that is uh, takes place over 10 years um, and financed by tax increases which is never popular in Washington so I just think in this uh, fear inflation backdrop um, that that infrastructure package may well um, be somewhat um, vulnerable to, to being um, uh, postponed or at least cut back. Uh, also issues about tech regulation, um, but um, again, that, that's something we need to keep watching. Um, but, uh, you know, not much more to say about that at the moment. Just moving along then, just in terms of investment themes. Um, so bottom line here is that we're in a new cycle. The US had a recession due to COVID. The unemployment rate uh, did spike higher, has improved, but it's still well above the rates we got to before we back, went back into recession, uh, going back last several decades, so before the tech record, before the GFC. So basically, to my mind, until such time as the US unemployment rate hits 4%, and particularly if it hits, you know, 3.5%, which is still a ways away, um, you're not going to see significant Fed tightening. You're not going to see significant risks to the US economy. Uh, and equity should continue to uh, broadly outperform bonds, albeit with a potential setback along the way, as we may be encountering at the moment. But the bigger picture here is that we're in a new cycle and growth can remain at an above trend pace. The unemployment rate can decline uh, before we get a, a sustained uh, pickup or, or inflation. Um, and that's sort of just thinking about it from a cyclical uh, point of view. Uh, so, so that's the equity position. I'd still be encouraged. I wouldn't be, you know, I still see the equity market outlook on, on, a, on, a, on a sort of one to three year view here is still quite uh, upbeat. Um, but uh, I guess in the short run, there clearly are some, some risks. Um, in terms of defensive yield, just to highlight, we have brought out a, a, another hybrids type of exposure at the moment. Um, well, we've got very, we've got two hybrids exposed now. One is an actively managed fund, and one is a, uh, a passively managed fund. And the new passively managed fund is BHYB. And just to highlight there that you know, for those that seeking are seeking defensive yield, hybrids do offer pretty attractive income. They're not, they are floating rates, so they're not subject to you know, bond yields do go up, which does hurt fixed rate bonds. It doesn't hurt hybrid bonds to 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 the same extent because they are floating rate bonds. And as you can see on the second slide there, uh, yes, 
hybrids do tend to weaken when you get major corrections in the equity market. There are somewhat correlated with the equity market, but the downside of hybrids, and particularly since the GFC, uh, has been uh, notably less than what you see on the equity market. So in that sense, you know, I do still see hybrids as a defensive type of exposure. Can you good yield uh, and less downside risk when, when equity markets pull back? In terms of thematics, I mean, this is just one. I mean, the, the, I just wanted to highlight. I mean, really, I, I boil down sort of global thematics to something like you know, some people call it growth versus value. So, like technology versus more traditional areas like energy and financials. And another one of relevance to Australia um, is like you know commodities versus technology. And the, the first slide there, the dotted line, shows you the cycles that we've been through over recent decades. The so late nineties, we had the cycle where um, IT, so technology outperformed mining, uh, and that was a, so that was the dot, cur, dot, dot com, the dot boom, the technology boom, Mark One, um, and that was a period where the Australian market tended to underperform. Then we had the commodity boom, where mining outperformed technology when China entered the WTO, uh, and our market outperformed. The dollar obviously broke up above a dollar to the US, uh, and uh, everything was. Um, you know, very, very strong in terms of our market. And then really since the GFC, we've had tech boom number two, where technology has tended to outperform commodities and our markets tended to underperform our global markets. So the question going forward is, you know, what sort of, are we going into a new technology uh, commodity boom? Some suggest we are because of green, and you know, to investment in green uh, technology, uh, I'm sorry, green renewable energy projects. Um, I tend to don't think we are going into a new commodity boom, although commodities are having a good run at the moment coming out of COVID. Um, and I think the technology, the growth technology thematic will basically reassert its outperformance um, once uh, the dust settles on, on COVID uh, later this year, moving into early next year. So I still see that broad thematic that's been in place since the GFC is persisting. Um, but again, that's just the way I kind of boil down uh, a lot of the, th and, and along the same lines, the areas like growth, so technology, um, outperforming uh, financials um, and, and energy stocks, the financials and energies, which is a big part of the, big part of um, the, the so-called value parts of the market. But, but at the moment, if you just go to the next slide, so value versus growth, so the, the orange sl uh, um, line there is uh, the global value stocks versus global growth stocks. So so those that tend to have a below average PE ratio, a price to earnings ratio, so low valuations. Uh, and historically, a low, lowly valued, I mean, as Warren Buffett would tell you, if you buy uh, companies on a low valuation, you typically get, you know, good returns. And so that's a screen that, that, that has companies with a below average PE. They tend to be energy and financial companies in the main. Um, and the high and the growth stocks are companies with above average PE ratios, and they tend to be areas like technology and consumer discretionary. Um, but as you can see, up until you, that, those uh, those various uh, tilts have waxed and waned over time. Value has outperformed growth for many decades uh, over the 70s, 80s, and up until the 90s. Although growth has had a period of outperformance, but since the GFC, it's really been a big, strong uh, shift toward growth. Um, and so the debate now is, are we seeing a, a switch back into value over growth? Um, and I think, yes, we are, but I think it's still going to be a relatively temporary, you know, maybe maybe another six months to a year uh, um, feature. And, it, and typically you can get periods where value does outperform as you come out of recessions. Uh, but thereafter, I still suspect that growth will, again, reassert its, uh, its um, outperformance over, over value because think tech disruption uh, is going to still remain a very major theme. Um, and I also ultimately think that bond yields aren't going to go up too much, which is going to constrain the, the performance of financials, which tend to benefit from, from uh, rising bond yields. And energy prices, you know, traditional oil prices are benefiting from the V-shaped recovery. But going forward, I think, you know, traditional energy companies are going to be somewhat challenged by the, you know, the, the new move to, to green energies. Uh, but that's uh, that's the way to – and to, to just uh, – I guess another thing in the favour of value at the moment, if you just go to the next slide, is the fact that if you look at the US market, going to the next slide, the, it is very concentrated in those big companies, uh, big tech companies. So we've had you know, many years now of tech outperformance, so the, the FANG stocks uh, have a big weight in the US market. 
Uh, as you can see, the, the, the top five companies have about 25% share of the, the S&P 500, which is something we haven't seen since the early 1970s, quite uh, extraordinary. Um, and so that does suggest you know, if, you, if you're uncomfortable with that degree of concentration risk and you can see our performance in some of the, the more medium, uh, smaller, mid-cap parts of the market, um, one easy way of doing that is to go go for an equal weight exposure to the US market through ETF QUS. Um, so that does give you exposure to the US market, but less less concentration to those big names uh, that dominate the market. Uh, tech managers, just I mean, just on technology, like so. Yeah, I mean, the, the Nasdaq. Well, I mean, again, the Nasdaq is trading at a high PE. Uh, it's come back a little bit now. It's around about 26, 27 times forward earnings. Uh, versus 20 for global markets. This is an above average valuation as you can see here, but by, by historic standards, it's not sort of way out of line. It's certainly nowhere near what we saw during the dot-com bubble. So just to, yes, yes, technology is richly valued relative to other parts of the market. And yes, it, that valuation is at an above average level, but it's certainly nowhere near what we saw during the dot-com bubble. And, um, and a lot of those companies these days are generating pretty good profits. And so, if their, their prices go sideways, or certainly if they correct back and earnings keep growing, then their valuations are just going to start to improve and, and ultimately they become a good buy again. Uh, but that's just the situation in terms of valuations. And the key point really of that slide is to compare the situation today versus the, the dot-com bubble um, you know, 20 years ago, and just to highlight that, you know, it is a different type of market today, although technology has certainly outperformed uh, in recent years. Just to, on the next slide, so again, th th those longer term, I mean, there are various ways to play the V-shaped recovery um, uh, outside of technology even. Again, even if you're a bit, bit questioning of technology at the moment um, but, and you think we, we're in the, this, the, 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 the sort of the, the, uh, the, the you know, higher, and higher commodity prices, um, uh, higher, higher um, you know, the strong earnings coming out of the, out of the, uh, the uh, recession, there are things like resources, so iron ore prices are very, very high. Uh, resources are ro rolling in cash. Iron ore prices should come back, but still stay pretty high, I think, um, by historic standards over the next year or so. So you can pick a mining stock or you can buy a QRE uh, resources uh, ETF that gives you exposure to the whole resources sector. Uh, small caps in Australia running uh, can run hard at this early stage of the cycle. Emerging markets. Um, and also global quality. Again, I'm running out of time here, so I won't go. These are things I've talked about in the past, um, but um, definitely different ways to get growth exposure easily through um, uh, any number of different exchange traded funds at the moment. So these are good ways to play. So basically, the first few there are ways to play the growth matic, the rebound uh, in the markets. Um, outside of the technology sector. And of course, if you do still like technology, then this pullback that we are seeing in technology could actually be a good buying opportunity in areas like ATEC, Australian technology, uh, cyber security, robotics uh, through Hack and RBTZ, and even the Asia technology um, exposure that, um, uh, that, that we have, uh, which is also having a pullback at the moment. Inflation exposures, and again, so commodity prices have been going up quite strongly. Food prices have been going up quite strongly, um, and there's different ways to play that inflation thematic. So again, if you, you know, if you um, do think that inflation is starting to pick up, you do relevance of a commodity uh, uh, cycle, and I mean, even if it goes for a year, there's still opportunities to, to play that thematic, even if it doesn't go for five years. But uh, QAU. Um, uh, food. So QAU is our, our gold exposure. So gold, gold. You know, if we, if we do get a pickup in inflation, gold should benefit. Uh, food is global food producers. Now this is a uh, really good performance over the past um, six months or so with the with rising food prices globally. And again, this is partly at least due to supply chain bottlenecks. Uh, demand for foods picked up. Chinese demand uh, for grain has picked up quite strongly over the past year as well. Um, QRE have already mentioned as our Australian resources sector ETF and fuel is global uh, energy producers again on the uh, very highly correlated to the oil price if you think oil's got more upside to go uh, you can um, you know um, gain exposure to that thematic through the through buying you know the top global energy producers um, uh, around the world so there are different ways to play that inflation thematic gold 
uh, global food through food, uh, food uh, Australian resource companies through QRE, uh, and fuel uh, global energy producers through fuel. Now, all of those are having pretty good gains at the moment. And again, if this inflation thematic persists for a while, they should um, continue to do pretty well. And just uh, some of the value exposures. Uh, okay, I mentioned equal weight, that's the QUS, so that's the equally weighted exposure to the US market. So again, it's the top 500 companies in the Australia, in the US market, all with a 0.2% uh, weight. So every, all, each 500, each company um, has, a, has a very equal, equal and very small weight. Um, banks and energy. So again, if we're on the cusp of an increase in bond yields, and again, this is not my call, but if you're, you know, more bearish on bond yields, do you think global bond yields are going to start to rise and the Fed's going to bring forward uh, policy tightening? Then something like BNKS um, will do tends to do uh, better in a rising bond yield environment. So that's the way to play rising bond yields if you're of that view. BNKS. I've already mentioned fuel. Uh, financials in Australia have been doing very well. So again, if you like banking stocks in Australia, you don't want to dabble in owning one or two and, and having a, you know chop company shares. You can just buy QFN, which is our overall uh, Australian uh, financial sector uh, um, ETF. And and outside of the US, I guess more value areas uh, simply because they have lower exposure to technology uh, and, and and Europe. Uh, 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 sort of seen as value exposures as well. So these are areas, Japan's been hit hard by another wave of COVID. Uh, it was actually doing quite well for, uh, uh, for several months there. And um, Japan and Europe are still struggling with COVID. But so you can actually see these as late recovery COVID stories in a sense. Um, they will both eventually get on top of COVID um, and their markets will then probably have about a burst of outperformance when they do get on top of um, their problems and the vaccines roll out. So. That's a, another sort of value, um, uh, another value play that uh, that we offer. Um, moving quite along, moving along. Look, I think I've reached the end of my um, my. And again, sorry again for the uh, technical hiccup. In, in, in I had to race through a couple of slides there just to make up for some time. Um, but um, that's uh, that's pretty much it. You know, we are on the cusp of enjoying a V-shaped recovery. I mean, the downside of the good, the, the downside of that is that. Um, uh, supply hasn't fully recovered, um, and so we are seeing an upsurge, you know, in the US and some inflationary pressures. And the debate is: is this, you know, the start as a sustained move, or is it more of a short run thing? And I'm still in the short run camp. Um, and as a result, you know, the bigger picture theme to focus on here is the ongoing recovery from COVID, um, which is, um, you know, I think ultimately still. Um, uh, good for equity markets, and to the extent we are seeing a, a pullback in the technology sector, um, that that will uh, should op, uh, become a good buying opportunity. So I see opportunities in this market to the extent technology is being hurt by short run inflation fears. Thank you, David, um, and we we certainly got there in the end. Thank you for your patience and uh, technology tips. Um, we will. Uh, send the slides and a cleaned up recording out to you all. So uh, just to sort of, uh, you can re-watch re the, the section um, that uh, that David dropped out on, but um, hopefully you you, um, you can look through the slides in your own time. Now, a lot of questions um, have come through and it's, it's great to see that a lot of you were anticipating David did talk um, specifically around commodities uh, and that value and growth uh, rotation. Um, Dave, I'll just ask just a couple of questions and we do understand if people do have to drop off, um, but just a couple of questions. Um, we always uh, get quite a few on thoughts on AUD, the Australian dollar uh, and US dollar. So I don't think you've touched on that today. So if you, you did just want to... Um, uh, share your Look, the, there. Uh, the, the Australian dollar is interesting. Like iron ore prices have again just gone ballistic. You know, beyond even the most optimistic forecasts, and they've you know gone up over two hundred dollars a ton now on the back of you know ongoing strong Chinese demand and disruptions. Even in Australia, we've had supply disruptions uh, because of um, you know cyclones and, and whatnot. And Brazil, because it's dealing with COVID, have had supply di disruptions. So we've had strong demand, supply disruptions. Iron ore prices have gone up as a result. 
Um, I, and funnily enough, I, the Aussie dollar, given where iron ore prices should be, you know, uh, when you mo when you model this historically, it should be actually up over eighty cents. And the fact that it's still sub uh, eighty cents is is um, um, you know quite 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 interesting. So look, it's hard to be bearish on the Aussie dollar at the moment for sure, and given where iron ore prices are. But over the coming year, I still see iron ore. Certainly, it's easy to say that today, given where they are. Um, I still see iron ore prices peeling back as China um, uh, basically does start to cut back on the, the stimulus it's been providing to its economy and to the steel sector in particular. Um, and and as, as supply gets back on stream, particularly in Brazil. Um, it, so with iron ore prices, and also as that's one element of it. The other element of is that the US economy is going to remain very strong. I see, if, if I'm right and the technology growth thematic does start to reassert its outperformance um, later this year, early next year, then that's going to favour the US dollar and not favour the Aussie dollar. So I wouldn't be, you know, I don't see the Aussie dollar going up to 80, 90 cents over the next uh, three to six months. I, if anything, I see it peeling back to the mid to low uh, 70 cent range. So not a big move, but, but more, but not, uh, more sort of pulling back a little bit rather than um, shooting a lot higher. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question on um, whether we're considering uh, a uranium ETF uh, to reflect the latest trends. Now, what I can say is uh, if, if we're not actually considering a uranium ETF um, in the in the short term, but it's always great to hear what what uh, ideas or, or what people are, are thinking about in terms of ETF exposures. Um, and, you know, absolutely the, you know, the, um, the, the trend towards uh, uranium and, and the interest from um, other people, but not on our radar just yet. Um, and Dave, another one from you, um, just in regards to and, and I know you did talk about gold um, and then using that as, as an inflation um, exposure, but just your thought of, thoughts on the gold price, gold and gold miners outlook. We've had quite a few questions from different people on that. Look, it's been interesting that gold, gold, gold basically hasn't rallied in the way you would have expected it to rally in, a, in an environment where we're fearing uh, an increase in inflation. Um, if anything, gold has been correlated with the movement in, in bond yields um, since last year. So when bond yields um, started rising um, from their lows, uh, bot, uh, gold actually uh, came off a bit. Um, and at the moment, even up until recently, it hasn't really benefited from those inflation fears. If anything, things like Bitcoin have benefited. So um, I, and as you can tell from what I've been saying, I don't think we're on the cusp of the breakout in inflation. If we were, I think, yes, you would be bullish gold. Um, but but on the view that I think what we're seeing is a temporary thing, I still have my doubts that we're going to see a sustained move, move higher in gold. Um, so that's just my view. And again, ultimately, I think the US dollar is going to start to strengthen, which doesn't favour gold uh, as well. And ultimately, you know, bond yields are going to go up. Fed will start renormalising rates, which is going to be a, uh, but that's you know a couple of years down the track. But that also will be um, not 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 good for gold. So I, I see a lot of headwinds. I, see, I still see more headwinds for gold than than, than, than tailwinds. So I'm not um, super bullish on it, uh, to be honest. And you know I say that you know I said we've got 60 funds. I don't necessarily have to be bullish on everything. Um, if I were, I wouldn't be credible. So uh, if you like gold, that's great. And we give you those exposures. But me personally, I just don't see the bull case for gold uh, at the moment. Um, just a question on, on your thoughts on Treasury inflation protected securities. Um, yeah, well, look, you can buy uh, index, index bonds. I mean, so bonds are... Um, you know, it comes down to your view on inflation. If you think inflation is going to break out a lot more than the market anticipates, then buying an inflation-protected bond will give you a better return than a than a non-inflation-protected bond. Because basically, you're going to. I won't get into the technicals of it, but uh, buying an index bond versus buying a non-index bond basically comes down to whether or not you think the inflation um, premium embedded in the the index in the nominal bond. Um, is is enough is enough 
to just to to account for the likely inflation we're going to get. If we if we get a lot more inflation than than um, than than is implied, then you're going to get a better payoff by buying an index bond because you're actually going to get index returns pegged to the increase in the CPI. Um, now, inflation expectations have already gone up a lot. So if you actually look at the implied inflation expectation nominal bond yields, um, they're actually at quite high levels or certainly at the top end of their range of the past few past few, um, uh, past few decades, So, which I think is probably overdone. Um, so if anything, I think nominal bond yields are probably giving you enough inflation protection already given those high uh, break -e implied break-even inflation rates. Um, would be my, my view. So it's probably, you know, a bit too late to sort of, you know, uh, go 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 indexed uh, in, in that sense. But they're definitely they're out there. But uh, you, when you buy them, don't think you're necessarily getting inflation protection. You're getting, um, you're going to get paid for inflation. Uh, but that's what nominal bonds also do because the yield on nominal bonds is always higher than the yield on an index bond. And the difference being the, the uh, basically the market's implied inflation uh, premium. Okay, great. Um, look, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, again, thank you very much for your patience during our technical issues today. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed it. There's so much to talk about uh, with the markets, the inflation, uh, the recovery, uh, a lot to talk about. This is a regular webinar um, and we run quarterly uh, with David. He shares his in-depth analysis um, and, and comments. Um, and I will just remind you that uh, with any investment, there is investment risk depending on the type of exposure that you are uh, investing in. So we do recommend you do your research. Uh, there are no guarantees. Everything that we've been talking about today has been very general in nature. Um, again, David said we have 63 funds, uh, so this is has been just a, a short mention on a, a number of those. We recommend you seek Prinet professional advice uh, before you make your decisions. Uh, and information such as PDS, PDSs are available on our website on each fund page. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to you uh, joining us next time. Uh, if you will be receiving a presentation and a recording later on today. Any questions, please feel free to come through to our website and let us know. Thank you for joining. Bye. Okay. Bye for now.